Hello and welcome to Your Favourite Teacher. This video will begin to look at George Orwell's Animal Farm. Today, I will talk you through the plot alongside linking the key characters in too. I'll also be giving a brief overview of the context, but we'll go into more detail on this in character-specific videos. First, let's look at the storyline. Chapter 1. The opening of the story shows the reader life on Manor Farm. Within the first few pages, we meet the majority of the main characters as they all meet for a secret meeting about life on the farm. During this chapter, we meet Old Major, Napoleon, Snowball and Squealer, the pigs, Boxer and Clover, the horses, Benjamin, an old donkey, and Molly, a mare. I will talk more about these characters in later videos, so don't worry if you're confused as to who they are. Old Major, the farm's prize boar, leads this meeting and talks about how the animal's effort and hard work all goes towards benefiting man, whilst they all get nothing in return. Typical. He talks about a dream he had the previous night and believes that it will come true. He tells the animals that a revolution is coming and that the downfall of man is near, starting with Mr Jones, the owner of Manor Farm. He finishes the meeting by singing Beasts of England, a song of revolution. Chapter 2 opens with Old Major dying peacefully in his sleep in early March. After his passing, the pigs are identified as the most intelligent on the farm, so begin to lead the other animals. Snowball appears to be very lively and wanting to help the animals, whereas Napoleon seems a lot quieter. Squealer is very talkative and great at persuading the other animals. In this chapter, the reader also meets Moses, a raven, who doesn't stop talking about Sugar Candy Mountain, which we can assume is heaven. In this chapter, Mr Jones, the owner of the farm, gets really drunk and forgets to feed the animals. This sparks the revolution because the animals break into the store shed to feed themselves, tired of Mr Jones's neglect. When Mr Jones and some of the farmhands try to stop them, the animals unite and fight back, eventually driving them all from the farm, followed by his wife, Mrs Jones. Following the revolution, the animals destroy everything that reminds them of man and begin to celebrate. At this point, the pigs have learnt to read and write using an old spelling book found by Snowball, and they create seven commandments for the animals to live by. Number one, whatever goes upon two legs is an enemy. Number two, whatever goes upon four legs or has wings is a friend. Number three, no animal shall wear clothes. Four, no animal shall sleep in a bed. Five, no animal shall drink alcohol. Six, no animal shall kill any other animal. And seven, all animals are equal. The cows begin to get restless and uncomfortable, so the pigs manage to milk them before the animals go to explore the farm. Napoleon is left to look after the milk, but when the animals return, the milk has mysteriously disappeared. In chapter three, the pigs decide to rename Manor Farm, Animal Farm. The animals work together to complete the harvest and it is noticed that Boxer, the horse, is working harder than everyone else. The pigs arrange meetings to be held weekly for the animals to discuss the running of the farm. The reader quickly realises that Napoleon and Snowball never seem to agree on anything. Snowball invests himself in helping the other animals, running several committees so they feel they have a voice and to teach them how to read and write. The animals aren't good at this and soon lose interest. The only animal that actually learns to read and write is Benjamin, the old donkey who moans a lot. Nine puppies are also born and Napoleon takes them to raise them himself. The pigs also announce that the milk and apples are reserved for the pigs to help them become better leaders. The animals don't seem to question this because Squealer tells them that if the pigs don't have the milk and the apples, Mr Jones will return. Squealer soon realises that this is a good tactic to keep the animals in order as they are frightened of Mr Jones's return. In chapter four, word about the revolution gets around to the neighbouring farms, Foxwood and Pinchfield. The owners, Mr Pilkington of Foxwood and Mr Frederick of Pinchfield, fear that the rebellion will spread to their farms, so decide to join forces with Mr Jones to win back his farm. The animals are ready for their attack and again work together to drive them out of the farm. All except Molly, the mare, who is far too worried about her looks and getting hurt to get involved. After the fight, the animals make badges, which are presented to one another to show their bravery. Snowball and Boxer both receive Animal Hero First Class medals, whereas a fallen sheep slain in the battle is awarded Second Class. This goes against the final commandment, all animals are equal, but no one seems to notice. At the beginning of Chapter 5, Molly disappears because she can't bear to live any longer without ribbons and sugar, which are considered too human for the animals. 
At a meeting, Snowball puts forward the idea of the animals building a windmill to help lighten the animal's workload. Napoleon disagrees and teaches the sheep to bleat, four legs good, two legs bad, whenever Snowball tries to speak. This reveals that Snowball and Napoleon are fighting for leadership on the farm, with Snowball proving more popular with the animals. In his jealousy, Napoleon calls the nine dogs to the meeting. These are the puppies that he had previously taken away to train. They appear menacing and vicious, chasing Snowball from the farm, leaving Napoleon to take control. Squealer uses his persuasive nature to convince the animals that Snowball was a traitor all along and had in fact stolen the idea of the windmill from Napoleon. In chapter six, the animals begin building the windmill with Boxer doing most of the heavy work. Napoleon starts to trade with the neighboring farmers who have given up trying to take back the farm. The other animals get excited when they see Napoleon bossing a human around, making them forget the first commandment about humans being enemies. The pigs also move into the farmhouse and begin sleeping in the beds. It's at this point that the commandments start to mysteriously change. Squealer has been changing the commandments in the middle of the night. No animal shall sleep in a bed without sheets. He convinces the animals that they had forgotten the commandments and seeing as none of them learned how to read properly, they accept that he was right. Benjamin remains ignorant to the situation. A violent storm destroys the windmill and the animals hard work, but Napoleon convinces them that it was Snowball's doing. He commands them to restart the building of the windmill. In chapter seven, we learn that there's a food shortage. So Napoleon orders the hens to give up their eggs for trading purposes. When they refuse, he starves them until they relent. Napoleon is rarely seen around the farm with Squealer delivering his messages for him mainly more lies about Snowball. Animals who are thought to be in a league with Snowball are slaughtered by the dogs and Beast of England is banned from the farm. Another pig, Minimus, creates a new song for them to sing, which praises Napoleon instead, of course. In chapter eight, another commandment is altered. No animal shall kill another animal without cause. And the animals seem to be working even harder despite the completion of the windmill mainly with Boxer's help. They decide to call it Napoleon Mill. Napoleon does more deals with Pilkington, the owner of Foxwood, who pays with fake money. So he stops all trade and turns his attention to Frederick and Pinchfield Farm instead. To get him back, Pilkington uses dynamite to destroy the windmill for a second time. Napoleon elevates himself even further on the farm, having a special gun salute put in place on his birthday and having a black cockerel to announce his presence he begins to act more like a king than the leader of Animal Farm. In chapter nine, work starts for the third time on the windmill. Boxer wishes to finish this before he retires, so works even harder than before, despite being told to slow down by the other animals. Although there's a food shortage, produce is sold by Napoleon to provide machinery and whiskey for the pigs. Meanwhile, Boxer collapses from being overworked. Napoleon arranges for him to go to the hospital but instead sells Boxer to the glue factory in return for more whiskey. Benjamin finally pipes up, reading the side of the van, taking Boxer away and alerting the other animals that he's being taken to his death. Squealer covers this up, saying that the van used to belong to the glue factory, but then it was bought by the vet. The animals believe him, with Benjamin saying nothing. Chapter 10 is set years later, with very few animals still alive who remember the original rebellion. The windmill has finally been finished, but has been used to produce corn rather than give the animals a better life like Snowball once told them. Squealer has trained the sheep to start bleating four legs good, two legs better, as the pigs appear on the farm, walking on their hind legs and carrying whips like humans. That's normal. The commandments have been removed, replaced by one. All animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. The pigs start to wear clothes and Napoleon changes the name of Animal Farm back to Manor Farm, just like in the beginning of the novel. One evening, the animals peek through the farmhouse window to see the pigs and local farmers drinking and playing cards. As they look between the two species, they find it harder and harder to tell who's who. So that's it for the plot. As you can see, it starts the way it finishes, which Orwell deliberately did to show that not all situations are easy to escape. Speaking of which, 
Let's take a look at the context. As an author, George Orwell was fascinated with social injustice and did lots of research surrounding the topic. He was particularly interested in the treatment of the lower classes. In particular, he was interested in the corruption of good people through political power and totalitarian regimes. This means that the government were controlling everything, economics, the media, and even the thoughts and values of the people. This was exactly what was happening during the Russian Revolution. Orwell wrote the book as an allegory for the Russian Revolution. An allegory is a story that reveals a hidden meaning, usually a political one. Think of it like an extended metaphor. All of the events and characters in the story symbolise different issues linked to the Russian Revolution. That's it for now. I hope the plot and context will be a great starting point for you to understand the story and its contextual links. Join us for more videos where we will break down key characters and themes. I'm Miss Shaw, thanks for watching.